standard setting project by the ISB. The first one that we had in July was about the primary financial statements. And I recognize some of you who were there at the time. And I think it was a very interesting discussion that we had. And from uh, my discussions with the ISB participants, they also took away interesting and important insights from that event. So we're gonna uh, do our best to repeat that experience today. And uh, I really welcome all of you into this meeting. Um, please feel free to ask your questions as we go through the material. And let's do this in the following way. Let's um, first of all, um, have an overview of the proposals and the related academic research presented by the participants here uh, in this meeting today. And let me briefly introduce the participants just quickly. So we have uh, four representatives uh, from the ISB here with us today. And Tarka and Tom Scott will be representing the board and will be answering to your questions should you have any. Uh, Tim Craig and Anna Simpson are staff members that have been instrumental in preparing the document that we're going to be discussing, and that is the discussion paper on goodwill and impairment today. And then we have two dear colleagues of mine, uh, Amir Amel Sadeh from University of Oxford and Martin Glaum from WHU Otto Weissam School of Management in Germany. Um, uh, together with myself, we have uh, a review paper on goodwill related uh, academic evidence that uh, is to some extent pertinent to the discussion paper today and uh, uh, which we will talk about as we go through the discussion paper topics. We will share some of the related research and try to summarize what that research um, says uh, about these issues uh, in question. So I can also already introduce and, and announce uh, that we're gonna have a third workshop of this kind uh, sometime early next year. And this is going to be about a related topic to some extent, business combinations under common control. We haven't figured out a date yet, but that is something that we will shortly um, communicate through um, the EAA website, uh, the Accounting Resources Center, and also in the next newsletter that's also gonna be featured. So we hope that you will also participate in that. Um, again, please feel free to uh, ask your questions. The way we should do this, I think, is for you to write your questions into the chat if you would like to ask them to the speakers. I will be monitoring the chat and I will call upon you to ask your questions to the speakers directly. If you would like to just make a comment and you would not like to speak up in the session, please preface your question with the note chat only. And in that way I can filter those questions. They will just uh, pass on to the ISB, uh, to the ISB representatives. And um, I can then select those that will actually be discussed here in the session. Good, in terms of the sequence of the topics, you will see that the uh, structure of the presentation today will follow not so much the, let's say the logic of the way we typically think about accounting issues, you know, recognition, measurement, presentation, disclosure, but we will follow the structure of the discussion paper, which starts with disclosure issues, as you will see in a second. Um, I think if there are no questions from your side, and uh, when I, Look into the faces of my co-hosts here. If I haven't forgotten anything, I would like to open the session and give the floor to Antarka, who will be leading us into the first topic. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Thorsten, and welcome. We thank very much the EAA, uh, Thorsten, and all the team for putting on this session today. We are so very glad to be speaking to you. We are so excited about having, at the moment, more than 112 people on the line. Um, when I looked at the list, people were coming from 56 countries potentially for today. This is just fantastic. So we're very pleased to be here. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time in attending. 
this joint IASB and EAA virtual research workshop. And as Thorsten said, we'd like to discuss the IASB's discussion paper, Business Combinations, Disclosures, Goodwill and Impairment. Before we start, as usual, as it is for any presentation, the views we express today are our own views and may not be shared necessarily by the rest of the International Accounting Standards Board or the IFRS Foundation. On this slide, you can see the link to the discussion paper. The discussion paper is still open. We value your feedback. We look forward to your comments. So to start today, we will have a look at an overview of the discussion paper. We started this after the post-implementation review of IFRS 3, and we published this discussion paper in March. The deadline for submitting comments has been extended to the 31st of December 2020 because of the coronavirus pandemic. While many people think this is a project about the accounting for goodwill, um, in fact, the objective of this project is broader. The objective is to improve the information that companies provide to users of financial statements at a reasonable cost about the companies that they buy. So the ISB hopes to help users of financial statements hold management to account for those acquisition decisions. The discussion paper has a number of specific questions for stakeholders. The ISB is particularly interested in hearing from stakeholders about how useful and feasible they think the new disclosure ideas are, as well as whether they have new evidence or arguments about the best way to account for goodwill. This is a very important set of proposals for the IASB, and I do really encourage people to respond to the discussion paper. Going now to slide six, you can see here a summary of the proposals presented uh, in the discussion paper and the IASB's preliminary views. So the preliminary views cover three main areas and they reflect the concerns the IASB heard from stakeholders. The first area relates to disclosures. The IASB's preliminary view is that it should propose to require companies to disclose information about how business combinations perform after the acquisition. The second area relates to improving the accounting for goodwill. The IASB explored whether it could make the impairment test more effective, but its preliminary view is that it's not feasible to improve the test significantly at a reasonable cost. The IASB then considered whether to propose reintroducing amortization and the IASB's preliminary view is that it should not do so because there is no compelling evidence that doing so would significantly improve financial reporting. Finally, the ISB explored some possible simplifications that would reduce the cost of performing the impairment test by removing the requirement put to perform the test annually and amending how value and use is estimated. The third and final area relates to some other topics. The IASB's preliminary view is that it should require companies to present total equity excluding goodwill on the balance sheet. The ISB also thinks it should retain the current approach of requiring companies to recognize identifiable intangible assets separately upon acquisition, rather than subsume some of these intangibles into goodwill. Um, it is worth emphasizing here that the views in the discussion paper are preliminary. Depending on the feedback and comments that the ISB receives from the outreach, Events, and that includes events such as the one today and our comment letters, um, the IASB may decide to re reconsider some or all of these preliminary views. So now I'd like to hand over to Tim, who will take us through these preliminary views in more detail. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so we're gonna now look first at the uh, preliminary views around disclosures. So one of the key messages that the ISB has heard from investors is that companies generally do not disclose sufficient information to allow investors to assess how well a business combination has performed post-acquisition. 
Investors want this information to hold management to account for its decisions to acquire those businesses. Most investors told us that the information is needed for stewardship purposes to help them, for example, determine whether they can trust management with future capital. Now, existing standards do not specifically require companies to disclose such information, and hence any information that's provided today is disclosed voluntarily. Therefore, the discussion paper explores whether to require companies to disclose information on the subsequent performance of business combinations. The ISP's preliminary view is that it should require companies to disclose in the year of acquisition, firstly, the strategic rationale for the business combination. But the rationale would be a high level statement that links the business combination to the entity's overall strategy. And that overall strategy may be set out somewhere else uh, in the company's annual report, for example, in its management commentary. Secondly, to disclose the key objectives of the specific uh, business combination, these being the more detailed aims that management intends to achieve as a result of the business combination. And thirdly, to disclose the metrics and targets that management will use to assess to what extent those key objectives are being achieved. Then in subsequent periods, the company would then disclose the business combination's actual performance based on those metrics to enable investors to assess to what extent the key objectives identified at the acquisition date are being achieved. So what kind of information do companies need to disclose in the subsequent years? Now, there's a wide range of business combinations uh, and they serve a wide range of purposes. So the ISB concluded that no single metric would be suitable for every business combination. Therefore, the ISB is exploring a management approach. In other words, the metrics disclosed would be those an entity's management uses internally to monitor whether the acquisition has met its objectives. Such measures could be operational, financial, or a mixture of both. Because acquisitions can often involve large sums of money, the ISP presumes that most companies are monitoring their major acquisitions. But if management is not monitoring the business combination, the ISP believes that the company should disclose this fact rather than the ISP prescribe a minimum set of information to be disclosed. And when we say the information being used by management, what do we mean by that? The discussion paper proposes that we use the perspective of a company's chief operating decision maker, which is a term that's used to identify the disclosures required for segment reporting under IFRS 8. The main reason why the ISB uh, is suggesting using the chief operating decision maker as a threshold in this new context is so that companies disclose the most important information about the most important business combinations. A lower threshold might result in excessive and costly disclosures, particularly for companies that make many acquisitions. So one thing that the ISP would like stakeholders' views on is whether using chief operating decision maker as a threshold would lead to companies disclosing all the material information that investors need about the business combinations that they want to know about. Now, the ISP is aware that some stakeholders have various concerns about providing this information. For example, what if the acquired business is integrated with an existing business post-acquisition? The, the answer to this depends on how management is monitoring the success of the business combination. For example, the chief operating decision maker may be monitoring the performance of the business combination using information about the combined business rather than the acquired business in isolation. In that case, the company would disclose information on those metrics about the combined business that the chief operating decision maker is using. The principle here is to disclose the information that management uses internally to monitor business combinations. The ISP is, the ISP is not expecting companies to create disclosures to satisfy the requirements, but to disclose the information that management are already using internally. Now, Sometimes when we discuss the ISP's preliminary view on the subsequent performance disclosures and the issue of integration is raised, it, it sometimes sounds like it prevents companies from monitoring the business combination and that therefore, when integration occurs, management do not know how well a business combination is performed. However, when we have the opportunity to discuss this further with stakeholders, we often find that management are still monitoring the business combination in some manner, 
and are aware of how well a business combination is performing, at least in the early years. Um, and that's as the board expected. Um, the discussion paper discusses some other concerns that the ISB has heard, uh, including whether this information is commercially sensitive and whether it's verifiable. Um, the ISB wants to explore these concerns with stakeholders and hope stakeholders raising these issues will also help the ISB find ways to address them, since in the ISB's view, it is reasonable for investors to ask companies to provide information that will help them understand better how a business combination is performing. So this slide summarises the ISB's preliminary views on some other targeted improvements to existing disclosures included uh, in IFRS 3. And these proposals are about the information provided in the year of acquisition, and which included requiring the disclosure of expected synergies, uh, of defined pension liabilities and debt assumed, as well as some changes to the actual and pro forma information disclosed about the acquiry. So uh, I'll now hand over to, I think it's going to be Anna, um, who's going to take us through some of the academic uh, research that's relevant to these particular topics in the discussion paper. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you, Thorsten. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, um, depending on where you are from me. Uh, my name is Anna Simpson, and uh, together with Martin Glaum, we are going to provide a somewhat high-level uh, overview of the academic uh, evidence that is relevant to the proposals in the discussion paper. And if you're working on a project that is related, please share it either in the chat room later or you can follow up uh, and please do by email, by uh, send your references or thoughts. Uh, my email is asimpson at ifrs.org. We we'll, would we'll love to hear from you. So on the question about improving disclosures uh, on acquisitions, the evidence from academic studies, and uh, there is also some evidence from non-academic studies that were published by regulatory bodies, is that there is a degree of non-compliance by companies with these disclosure requirements and sometimes even if companies provide disclosures, they can be non-informative and boilerplate. So some studies have therefore examined what factors drive uh, this variation in the provision of disclosures and in the quality of disclosures. And um, they have the evidence uh, from these studies is that uh, the variation is not random. And in fact, the provision of disclosures and the quality varies uh, with certain firm characteristics, for example, the amount of goodwill balances on uh, the balance sheet, or uh, also country characteristics such as the level of enforcement, but also uh, the, the provision and quality of disclosures uh, varies with uh, managerial reporting incentives. Despite this, on average, uh, the takeaway from the literature is that M&A and uh, goodwill related disclosures matter to analysts and investors. Some studies, for example, show that uh, the uh, higher quality disclosures are associated with lower forecast errors and lower dispersion among analyst forecasts and overall uh, high quality disclosures uh, are linked to lower disagreement in the market, reduced uncertainty and um, therefore lower cost of capital. So uh, with this, uh, I will pause here and inv invite uh, Martin who has done extensive work in the area to add his takeaway of uh, the academic literature and uh, conclude on this uh, particular topic. Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. And uh, I would like to start by saying that it's a great honor being able to participate in this uh, um, event here in, in, in this form. It's a, it's a great pleasure also. Um, yes, uh, as Anna mentioned, I have done uh, several studies uh, that uh, you know, work with these disclosures and uh, some of them of a more descriptive nature with more practice oriented audience, uh, some of them with uh, you know, directly the audience um, of the uh, journals, the, the academic outlets. Um, summarizing my own impression maybe here is uh, of my own work and of the literature as I see it is, 
that, uh, the, first of all, I mean, this is always quite interesting. There is quite a lot of non-compliance out there. My impression is, although the studies, you know, it's, it's difficult to aggregate them and then directly compare them, it seems that it would be natural also that uh, the level of non-compliance has gotten down a bit. Compliance has gotten a better, a little bit better over time. But all studies that I'm aware of report a significant degree of non-compliance. I am not aware of a single instance. I've, you know, personally seen hundreds of these reports and in some cases blatant non-compliance with the, uh, the uh, required disclosures on m and transactions, I've not, not seen a single report with any qualified audit opinion on it. I've, that's always an, something that I found uh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, and maybe a final remark, the problems with uh, you know, uh, disclosure don't end with you know, direct non-compliance. Non-compliance in a way is, is simple to detect and would be quite simple maybe to, uh, to to change. I think it's also problematic that uh, when companies do provide some uh, disclosures, that they are often not really very insightful. So we as academics read them probably the same way analysts would read them. Uh, however, you know, they, the information often given is very sparse, very limited, and doesn't really uh, provide a lot of insight into matters that are in reality extremely complex either the M&A transactions themselves or the uh, goodwill impairment testing. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you all very much for um, introducing the topic and summarizing the relevant research. And now we're of course interested in your views um, among the participants and your questions. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question of one of the panel members, please. Uh, let me know, raise your digital hand or Thorsten, um, speak up. Yeah, Thorsten, Thorsten it's Tim here. Um, maybe if we start with a polling question, because we've got a few polling questions okay. that, that are within the presentation. So yes, it might be an idea to kick off with this polling question, uh, which is the first one, which is uh, for participants to think about whether they think the ISB's proposals to require the disclosure of information about the subsequent performance of business combinations will provide users of financial statements with useful information. So if I can get the technology <laughs> to work, so let's have a go. Uh, hopefully the poll has just been launched and has appeared on your screens. Um, so the, the, um, the options are A, yes, you, you do agree um, with uh, the proposals. B, no, the information will not be reliable enough to be useful. C, no, because some of the information is commercially sensitive. Companies will not provide all the information necessary to be useful. And D, no, because of integration, management do not have the information on the performance of their business combinations. And if you do happen to agree with you know, more than one answer, then just please select the one that you agree with the most. So we'll just keep that going for a little bit longer. So maybe these questions will prompt you to uh, ask your own related questions. Um, Tim, if, if I'm thinking in principle, if the information were disclosed, it would be of great use to investors, but I do think that it will not be disclosed because of the reasons below. What would I, would I, what would I reply? Mm -hmm. would you like to, how would you like us to do this? Um, so, so, so are you asking how do, how will the board deal with some of these issues? Just interpreting just interpreting the question. So, if if I'm a respondent here in the call yeah. and I'm thinking yes, in principle this would be a great disclosure, but having said that, I don't think that companies will will be able to provide the information for the yeah. Reason. So, so I think you would then say no uh, uh, because of some of the barriers. So, and that's what we're hearing um, in some of our outreach that um, people think that in theory, the idea is, is good, but in practice, they, they worry about uh, some of these barriers around commercial sensitivity or, or integration as to whether that will uh, provide useful information. Um, Let's maybe just stop the poll there because it, it seems to be, I'll give it another five seconds for those latecomers. Um, it seems to be calming down and then I can share the result at least. Um, 
just, uh, yeah, let's end the poll there then. And hopefully, hopefully you can now see the results. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Um, so, I mean, just looking at this, I mean, there's 40% of people that do think that... Yes. May, uh, may I say something? Sorry. Fabio, yes, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, uh, yes, I, I marked C, but uh, uh, it's, it's uh, difficult sometimes to choose just one option and not to explain the reasons behind that. Yes, I put C uh, because I think uh, if EAS does not provide uh, the specific information that companies should uh, disclose, uh, given uh, the sensitive information behind this, uh, the business combinations in general. So I, I'm i not so sure that uh, this will provide uh, a significant set of information with the quality for, for users. So just to, to explain how I put C, because I, I have some concerns about um, the comparability of the information if the, the, the information is not um clearly defined to 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 use this by by the IASB. thank you so much yeah so just a couple of points on that then so on comparability um i think the board wasn't necessarily looking for this information to be necessarily comparable and that's why it went down the management approach because it felt that actually different acquisitions are different and they're done for different reasons and different companies will yes, have yes, different, that also, yes. di di different ways of monitoring them uh, uh, and therefore that's why the board decided to leave it open to a management uh, approach uh, and it felt that that information might be even more useful because it gave it, it might give investment insight into how um, management are actually uh, managing the, the business. So I think the important thing here was the board was trying to put some um, requirement around providing this information because what it hears from investors is that, um, that, that they're not getting this information um, regularly. Some companies do provide some information uh, but actually the investors are not getting enough information on the subsequent performance. So the requirements are there to really um, improve the provision of that information where necessary for all, you know, for, for all business combinations where it's necessary to provide that information. Uh, but then on your point on commercial sensitivity and, and also to Thorsten's comments at the, the start, yeah, so we have heard that commercial sensitivity um, could be an issue. Um, uh, and, and therefore, whilst some people say, yes, this is good in theory, but in practice, because of, let's say, commercial sensitivity, yeah, we're unsure yeah. whether the information will be useful. I mean, I think uh, the ISB would certainly like to hear stakeholders explain what type of information they think would be commercially sensitive. Because what some investors say is that companies often provide lots of information when the acquisition is announced in press releases and analyst presentations, explaining the strategic rationale and also explaining the benefits that management expect from the acquisition. Um, and investors say all they want is just some follow up on that information. And they, and they say that presumably that information is not commercially sensitive because companies were willing to disclose this information in those earlier materials. But in addition, some investors have also said that actually being required to disclose information that may be commercially sensitive is just the consequence, isn't it, of being listed and of being able to use investors' capital to make these acquisitions. Investors should be able to hold management to account um, for, for these acquisition decisions. And then maybe if I just comment on a couple of the other answers here. So, um, so there are some answering uh, B, um, uh, the information wouldn't be um, reliable uh, enough and, and and certainly some stakeholders do think that management will be able to manipulate the information to show the acquisition in a, a good light rather than rather like I suppose using optimistic cash flows in the impairment test of course the information would be audited though but then some stakeholders do worry about how auditable the information would be and that's obviously something that um, the board wants to hear from um, auditors on. And then finally on, on, on D, so those that 
are answering Dean um, about integration and that integration might mean that management don't actually have the information. Um, as I said earlier, I think the ISB thinks that even when integration occurs quickly, that management would still be aware of how well an acquisition is performing, at least in the first few years. But it would be interesting to hear from stakeholders whether integration does mean that management do not know how well an acquisition is performing. Uh, as I said, when we had the opportunity to discuss this further with stakeholders, we often find that management are still monitoring the business combination in some manner, and whatever that information they are using would still be useful for investors. But I mean, that's something that um, we'll obviously be happy to hear more feedback on. But thanks everyone for um, uh, for the uh, polling results there. So Thorsten, maybe if I hand back to you, I'll stop yes. sharing the results. Yes, thank you, Tim. Tim, we have a question from the audience. David Windisch would like to comment. Please, David. Hi. Hi. Um, just a question regarding the, the metrics the firms will uh, use to evaluate this m and performance. So uh, we, we have a similar approach in, in, in segment reporting with the um, management approach. And also at the segment level, um, firms use many different measures to, to capture uh, the, the performance of their business units and things like that. So I, I guess that the same will happen and, uh, um, if you evaluate the performance of MDA. So which, which of the measures um, uh, do, you, do you expect to see or, or how do you basically uh, manage that, that firms report uh, the, the most interesting measures and not just uh, one of the, the, um, the, let's say boilerplate or whatever, um, which is also related to compliance in a way, right? You, you could easily comply by reporting a measure that is not very helpful in evaluating actually the, the M&A, while the, the really interesting measures are kept um, um, private in a, in a way. So I'm, I'm wondering how that would work here. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think um, uh, in, in terms of the the, the types of metrics, uh, as I said, it's a management approach. So it's whatever management think is the most important. Um, and so the board, uh, the board did think about whether it should prescribe some minimum metrics, but decided actually um, there wouldn't be a particular set of metrics that would be relevant for all business combinations. Uh, and actually in the feedback that we've heard from outreach, I mean, there's some mixed views on that. Some people think that the board should think about at least some minimum metrics. Um, but in terms of you know, uh, the management approach and therefore it's up to management to decide what they think is the most important. To, to your point and the concern, I guess, that while they might just choose some metrics that aren't particularly interesting and uh, actually maybe, maybe, uh, maybe as we talked about before, maybe show the acquisition in a good light, but it's not, um, it's not the key, the key metric and the key objective. I think um, we would hope that there would be market reaction to that and investor reaction to that and market discipline to that, because I think what the purpose of these um, metrics and also disclosing the objectives is providing investors with information to hold management to account. Now, if, if a company um, gives some fairly bland um, objectives for a business combination and some very simple metrics that don't really give you much insight. I think an investor might rightly be worried, well, if that's how management are monitoring this acquisition and think are thinking about the objectives of this business combination, I'm not entirely sure whether I'm confident in management. And so I, I, I would hope that there would be market discipline and investor reaction to that that would help, mm -hmm. uh, would, would help the better quality of, of information. But I do take your point because the board has taken this management approach. It therefore does give companies, I guess, a degree of flexibility around what they, 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 they're, they're disclosing. Mm -hmm. um, but we would hope they're disclosing what, 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 the, what the most important information is. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tim. So there, there isn't currently a question in the chat. So I'm, I might have a quick comment related to David's question. I would hope that another disciplining force uh, would be the auditor. I mean, if the auditor uh, were to attest to whether the metrics being reported are consistent with the one used internally for decision making, uh, that would be something uh, that we also already see now, of course, in other contexts, right? Is, is for example, in the context of the impairment test, is management relying on 
uh, the numbers that they also use for internal planning and budgeting. So, so some consistency check between what's being reported to the outside and, and what is used internally, that is something that the auditor could make sure. And, and I think the disclosures, to me personally at least, the disclosures that you're proposing here, that is something that investors have a reasonable right to, to see, I would think. I mean, if, if my wife came back uh, um, from shopping with a 5,000 euro handbag um, and I ask her, you know, this costs only 200 euros to make. Why did you pay so much money for it? She could tell me, um, you know, I just liked it. I wanted it. Makes me feel good. I don't have to explain. But if you're a CEO acquiring a company uh, and 90% of the purchase price turns out to be goodwill, investors have a right to know why you did that and what you're expecting to see in the future from that investment. So I think those disclosures are very reasonable. And I think where researchers can help, and if you guys in the, in the, um, in the meeting here, if any of you guys have pertinent research on this, we would love to hear about it. So research that really goes into companies and finds out how in practice M&A um, acquisitions, uh, M&A transactions are actually monitored. So how do companies do this in practice uh, in terms of case study evidence even? I mean, preparers can, can tell us a lot about what they can and cannot provide and what they would like or not like to provide, but really getting into the firms and observing what they do and what kind of information they have. That would be interesting. And that's of course something that, um, you know, large uh, scale, broad, uh, broad level um, empirical archival research cannot really get at. Good, so that, that should have given you time to ask more questions, right? Um, there's one in the chat. Uh, that is coming from Edgar Löw. Edgar, please. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And, and thank you for the presentation and the discussion. It is really great to, to have you here. Um, according to what Torsten, you just said, um, I would like to make a short comment coming from practice. Sometime, sometimes it's really difficult to say after a while um, whether um, the synergy effects are really there. Why? Because the best um, you integrate a new subsidiary, and for example, if you, if you go to a client, to make an easy example, if you go to a client, um, Previously, um, you would have gone alone. Now, um, the other and the other company would have gone alone to the same client. Now you go together, and you get you get the job. The question is, do you get the job because of a previous company A or previous company B, or of the combination of com um, the both companies? And mm -hmm. it is very difficult to find out whether this is really mm -hmm. coming from the combination of both companies, and therefore to manage or to measure. Um, the success rate of that um, of that um, M and A activity, mm -hmm. and that makes it easy. It ma makes it difficult for companies to really follow up in in terms of numbers. So from from us from the academic world, we we um, try to figure out by certain indicators whether this was successful and combine it with the share prices or something like that. But it is very very indirect, and and um, it is really difficult to really find out what the effect of the merger has been in terms of um, raising synergy effects. Mm -hmm. Tim, that is probably consistent with what you're hearing and basically underlying uh, uh, response D in your poll, right? Yeah, very very much so. And, and yeah, we can understand and I think the board appreciates that particularly where integration happens quickly and particularly for example that you give there on synergies, um, trying to work out, well, who actually created that cost saving or that revenue synergy? Uh, was it the existing business and I would have got that anyway? Or was it because of the acquisition? Yeah, is is a really difficult uh, judgment. Um, but I think the board expects that management are trying to monitor that in some way and making some judgments around uh, around that and, and around, particularly if they've spent hundreds of millions of euros on a particular acquisition off the back of some cost synergies, for example, that, and that's made, if that's a major part of why they spent so much on a, 
are on an acquisition. You you would imagine, or the board would hope, that the that that companies are making some assessment of whether they think they have actually paid the right price and whether they are achieving um, uh, those cost say synergies, albeit that there was likely to be a lot of judgment that has to be applied and it is going to be really difficult judgment. And and that's what I think the board's interested to hear from stakeholders from um, is actually how do they do that? Um, are they able to do that? Do they think the judgment just makes the data not reliable enough to be presented in the financial statements is that is that a reason um for for, for not presenting it and um, what we're what the board's also doing is doing some field work it's planning to do some field work with a number of companies just to try to get some more detailed insight i think into uh, the nature of some of these concerns like commercial sensitivity and integration and how much of a barrier they actually are and is there a a route through some of those uh, barriers. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's an excellent point that, that, that you make and um, it's something that we'd like to explore more uh, with stakeholders to see how much of a barrier it, it, it really is and how companies are, from an internal governance perspective, getting comfortable that they are spending the right amount on acquisitions. But thanks for the question, it's great. So this is an interesting one that we could go on talking about. But looking at the time, I think we are about ready to move to the next section of the workshop today. And that is about improving the accounting for goodwill itself. And I would like to hand back over to you in that's the me. IHB. Yep. And yep. Um, would that be you, Tim, walking us yes, through that? Me. Okay. Yes, yeah, so now um, we'll now discuss the other main topic in the discussion paper, which is the subsequent accounting for goodwill. So there were two key pieces of feedback, um, at, at which were that stakeholders said that impairment losses were recognised too late, and investors have often reflected reductions in their valuations long before impairment losses are recognised by companies. And secondly, stakeholders said that the impairment test is costly and complex. Now, in response to this feedback, the ISB explored whether it could make the impairment test more effective at recognising impairment losses on acquired goodwill on a more timely basis. And we'll take a look at the ISB's work in that area first, and then we'll look at the ISB's preliminary views on whether to reintroduce amortisation and on its efforts to reduce the cost and complexity of the test. So the ISB identified two possible reasons for the too late issue. Cash flow forecasts that are too optimistic and shielding. Now on the first issue, IS 36 requires management to use forecasts that are reasonable and supportable to assess the reasonableness of assumptions by examining the causes of differences between past forecasts and actual cash flows and to assess the reasonableness of those past forecasts. In addition, companies are required to disclose information about the assumptions used to provide investors with information to assess the reliability of those impairment tests. The ISB's preliminary view is that if forecasts are too optimistic, this is more of an implementation issue that's better dealt with by auditors and regulators than by standard setting. Now, this slide um, looks at the second issue, which can lead to impact costers on goodwill not being recognised when stakeholders might think they should be, which is shielding. Now, before we start, an important point to mention here is that the impairment test is not a direct test of goodwill. Goodwill does not generate cash flows on its own. It can only generate cash flows in combination with groups of other assets and so can be tested for impairment only with those other assets. Goodwill is therefore tested for impairment in a cash generating unit or a group of cash generating units. Hence, the test is an indirect test since goodwill cannot be measured directly. The unit of account for the test is the cash generating unit. So this slide provides a simple illustration of the shielding issue. On the left hand side of the slide is the acquired business and something's not turned out as expected and an impairment loss would be recognized if the acquired business was tested in isolation. However, in most cases, the acquired business is integrated with some other part of the acquirer's business, 
often to achieve synergies management expected from the business combination. In this example, the acquired business is integrated into one of the acquirer's existing businesses, and there's significant headroom in that existing business. Its recoverable amount ex exceeds the carrying amount of it recognized assets. And that may be from internally generated goodwill that's not been recognized or unrecognized intangibles, or simply because the fair values of the recognized assets are higher than their carrying amounts. Because in this example, the combined business is tested for impairment as a cash generating unit, no impairment loss is recognized since, as shown by the right hand side of the slide, the combined recoverable amount exceeds the combined carrying amount of the assets of the combined business. The headroom of the existing business is shielding the acquired goodwill from impairment, and hence this simple example illustrates the two late issue. Shielding occurs in the current impairment tests because the reduction in value is first absorbed by the unrecognized headroom. An impairment loss is recognized on the acquired goodwill only if all of that headroom has been used up. So the ISP looked at an approach to reduce the shielding effect, incorporating that headroom into the impairment test. And the approach would have compared the recoverable amount to the carrying amount of the recognized assets plus the headroom from the previous impairment test. This prevents the prior period headroom automatically absorbing any reduction in the value of the combined business. Any impairment that results, basically any reduction in the headroom since the previous test, still needs to be allocated between the acquired goodwill and the unrecognized headroom. However, the approach attempted to allocate at least some of the reduction to the acquired goodwill, whereas in the current test, it's first allocated to the unrecognized headroom. However, any allocation would still be imperfect because it's not possible to tell how much of the reduction relates to the acquired goodwill and how much of the reduction relates to the unrecognized headroom since goodwill is not directly measurable. In addition, the approach would be costly. So the ISP's preliminary view is that it's not feasible to design a different impairment test that's significantly more effective than the current impairment test in IS 36 at a reasonable cost. The ISP accepts the test is not perfect because goodwill has to be tested with other assets. Some degree of shielding will likely always occur. The test will not always provide a signal of how well the business combination is performing. But this does not mean the test has failed, as some people say. And although cash flow forecasts will always be judgmental, applied well, the test should meet its objective of ensuring that the carrying amount of the cash generating unit as a whole is recoverable. And the disclosures proposed on subsequent performance that we've just been through should provide better information about the performance of a business combination than the impairment test can. And in fact, providing such information is not the purpose of the impairment test. So moving on to um, the board's consideration of amortization. In, in the post-implementation review, several stakeholders said that the ISP should reconsider amortization of goodwill and since amortization provides a simple mechanism that does target goodwill directly, the ISB explored whether amortization of goodwill should be reintroduced. And this slide lists some of the arguments for amortization and some of the arguments for the impairment only approach that stakeholders put forward. And the discussion paper contains a fuller discussion of the arguments for both approaches. And firstly, just a point of clarification, when we're talking about the reintroduction of amortization, this would be with an impairment test as well. So those in favor of amortization argue that the post-implementation review has demonstrated that the impairment test is not as rigorous as the ISP expected and does not provide as much information as the ISP expected because of shielding, carrying amounts of goodwill can be overstated and so the test does not hold management to account. And they argue that an amortization expense in the income statement would hold management to account, reporting companies as profitable only if they generate enough profit to cover that expense. Some stakeholders argue that goodwill is a wasting asset and amortization is the only way to show consumption of that goodwill and to prevent internally generated goodwill being recognized in the place of acquired goodwill as it's consumed. Although it's hard to estimate the useful life of goodwill, some argue this is no harder to estimate than for other assets. And some argue that amortization takes pressure off the impairment test 
and ultimately reduces the cost of performing the test. On the other hand, stakeholders in favour of the impairment only approach argue that the impairment test provides more useful information than an arbitrary amortisation expense. Although often only confirmatory, they say it's still more useful than an amortisation expense that most investors would ignore. And unexpected impairment losses do occur and can have a significant effect on the company's share price. They argue that the impairment test is working as expected. The objective of the impairment test is to ensure the combined carrying amount of cash generating units containing goodwill are not higher than their combined recoverable amount. If applied well, the test meets that objective. Also, when developing IFRS 3, the ISB was aware of the shielding, but concluded then that the test was rigorous. Some argue that goodwill is not a wasting asset with a determinable finite life. Companies acquire, uh, acquire businesses with an expectation that the acquired goodwill is maintained indefinitely. And some argue that even if goodwill is amortised, an impairment test would still be required. And amortisation would therefore not significantly reduce cost. The ISB's preliminary view that it should retain the impairment only approach was by a narrow majority. The ISB was, like stakeholders, quite split on this topic. However, the preliminary view reflects the majority view that there is no compelling evidence changing back to an amortisation model would be a significant improvement. Note, this isn't simply about which model is better, but whether there is compelling evidence that a change is needed. Given the narrow vote, the ISB welcomes feedback on this topic from stakeholders. However, just repeating well-known arguments will not necessarily move the debate forward. And instead, the ISB welcomes feedback that provides new evidence or arguments, or perhaps reasons why previous arguments are now more relevant. So the other feedback from stakeholders during the post-implementation review was that the impairment test is costly and complex to perform. Hence the ISB considered whether there were ways of reducing the cost of performing the impairment test without significantly impacting its robustness. And this is discussed on, on this slide. One of the reasons given for the cost of the test by companies is the requirement to perform the test even when there's no indication of impairment. The ISB's preliminary view is that it should remove the requirement to perform quantitative test annually. However, companies would still need to assess at each reporting date whether there's an indication of impairment. And if such indication exists, a company would have to perform the quantitative test. This change should reduce costs for companies. However, there are mixed views on the extent of this reduction. And there's also mixed views on the impact this would have on the robustness of the test. Some believe this introduces further judgment into the test and that not performing the test regularly could result in a decline in the expertise with which companies perform the test. Some also believe an indicator-based test should only be introduced if amortization is reintroduced. And this was another preliminary view where the ISB's majority was narrow. The majority considered the reduction in costs significant, which would help offset some of the costs of providing those new disclosures and the reduction in the robustness of the test marginal. Performing the test when there's no indication of impairment is unlikely to identify a material impairment and will provide little information to investors. And performing the test every year cannot solve the shielding issue, for example. The ISB's preliminary view is that it should also extend this change to intangible assets with indefinite useful lives and intangible assets not yet available for use. These assets are also currently subject to an annual quantitative impairment test. The ISB also considered some simplifications to how value in use is estimated, uh, which could in turn improve the impairment test. Currently, IS36 prohibits the inclusion of cash flows from an uncommitted restructuring or, or from enhancements or improvements to assets in the cash flow forecast companies use to estimate value in use. The stakeholders have said Excluding those cash flows can be difficult, particularly determining which cash flows relate to maintenance versus expansion capital expenditure. As well as reducing costs, removing this restriction could make the test easier to understand where an asset or cash generating unit contains the current potential to be enhanced or restructured 
that would be reflected in the asset's fair value. If that potential is also available to the owner of the asset, it's logical that it's also reflected in its value in use. However, there are concerns this change could increase the risk of cash flow forecasts that are too optimistic. And the ISB did consider whether to set a threshold for including these cash flows in value in use estimates or to require additional disclosures. However, the ISB considered the requirements in IS 36 regarding reasonable and supportable assumptions that already apply to the other cash flows in value in use estimates should provide sufficient discipline over these cash flows as well. Thus, the ISB's preliminary view is that it should remove the restriction on including these cash flows in estimates of value in use without any additional threshold or disclosures. Stakeholders also commented that the use of pre-tax cash flows and a pre-tax discount rate to estimate value in use did not reflect how such estimates are performed in practice, generally being estimated on a post-tax basis, and that pre-tax discount rates are not observable. Hence, allowing value in use to be estimated using post-tax cash flows and post-tax discount rates, which is the ISP's preliminary view, would make the test easier to understand and provide investors with more useful information where, for example, post-tax discount rates are disclosed rather than pre-tax discount rates. So uh, I'll now, I think I'm handing over to Martin, who's going to take us through a summary of the academic research that's relevant to these particular topics in the discussion paper. Yes, thank you, Tim. Um, um, yes, and I start with the uh, critical observation. Uh, obviously, in the light of the very controversial discussion about the impairment only approach, it would be very interesting for research uh, to come up with you know, direct comparisons of the older uh, amortization regime and the impairment only approach that was introduced by uh, the ISB in 2004, 2005, and uh, a few years earlier by the FASB. Uh, it would be very interesting to uh, devise and then conduct studies that directly compare the quality of financial reporting, the reporting outcomes under these two approaches and, and make statements about some sort of superiority or inferiority of one or the other approach. Um, I can tell you that I personally, and I can also tell you that together with my uh, very highly esteemed colleagues, Torsten and Amir, we've also thought about this very, very deeply, whether such tests would be possible and, and how one would do that. There are a few studies uh, who attempt to do that. I personally think this is very problematic to do. And the reason is that uh, the uh, outcomes that we do observe under the two regimes, the old financial reporting outcomes up until 2000 in the US and 2004 under the IRS countries. And the new ones are simply not comparable for at least two reasons. One reason is that before the introduction of the impairment only approach, companies could use pooling of interest in many countries, especially in the US. And a great number of com companies, the majority of them um, did actually use it. And in other countries, um, uh, it was uh, an option for companies to set off goodwill uh, immediately um, uh, against reserves. And uh, it is clear, I think, that the uh, decision whether to use pooling or whether to use the setting off of goodwill against reserves, that that was not simply taken randomly, but it was guided by the objectives of the company and, and its management. So in other words, without controlling for these incentives of the companies and the prior periods that use pooling and that use setting off, I don't think you know we can uh, directly compare the outcome right. and infer anything from these outcomes on the quality of the actual reporting. A second effect is, of course, and we know that from research in other areas, that uh, if we were to do this, we would be comparing periods with each other outcomes in the period up until, let's say, for IFRS 2004, and under the impairment only from 2005 onwards. And that's difficult because a lot of things have changed, especially what has changed is uh, the quality and the rigor uh, um, of, um, uh, of enforcement, as we know. So therefore, for all of these reasons, uh, uh, I think it is practically 
at least very difficult, maybe even in, uh, impossible, you know, to come up with a study that addresses that very, very interesting uh, question directly. Which means that we can make statements about, you know, how well does the impairment only approach function and then how does it compare to, uh, to amortization? We can only indirectly infer that. And I will be honest, I think that also as academics, we are at the end of the day left to make some, you know, uh, judgment if we want to make any statement on what is better, what is the better accounting. Okay, I come to the second point. The goodwill from acquisition provides information to users uh, before and after the introduction of um, the IOA. Uh, that refers to two types of studies, relevant studies and studies where um, researchers look at the predictive value of uh, goodwill positions. Uh, if essentially what people try to infer here is whether goodwill is an asset or is perceived as an asset at least by investors in the markets. Uh, value relevance, of course, uses correlations between the balance sheet positions or if you have a return specification of changes in positions with uh, uh, prices, levels of changes of prices. Um, and tries to infer whether the information you know, that we see in the, in, the, in the accounting is at least commensurable with the information used by the investors. We cannot directly make any um, statement whether they have used it, but it is at least compatible with the information if there is a systematic correlation. And studies, and numerous studies over time have found such correlations. So in other words, goodwill, I think, that there cannot be any reasonable doubt about that has been shown to be value relevant. And that value relevance was there before and after. As I said, there are studies that try to suss out differences, but I would not put too much weight on that personally. There are also studies, especially a study that is in the, cited here in the middle, Lee, that uh, do show that goodwill positions are systematically related to uh, future cash flows. In other words, they do reflect expected benefits as we would expect from uh, assets. Maybe a short final point here. There are also indications, and that's relevant, I think, to the discussion that is the, the general discussion. There are also indications that goodwill may lose its value rele relevance over time. There are some studies that seem to indicate uh, that uh, younger, fresh uh, goodwill, goodwill from recent acquisitions is more value relevant than older uh, goodwill. So that raises the issue whether if we take that at face value, goodwill really is a non-wasting asset. The next bullet point addresses research that looks at the debt contracting usefulness of um, goodwill. Um, here, you know, as someone who looks at that research, I have um, two feelings about this to, and then in, in balance it, or to taken together, it's a mixed feeling. On the one hand, there are relatively few studies and uh, I find them interesting. They look at a very important question. At the same time, I think the evidence is, uh, it's maybe also interesting in a descriptive sense, but I wouldn't say it is very, very compelling. Uh, to me at least, I, I, I would say it like that. Um, the studies that we cite here seem to indicate that over the years, um, companies write debt contracts where the, uh, um, the uh, uh, covenants make less use of, um, of covenants that include intangibles. In other words, there is a tendency to, to exclude intangibles and to exclude um, uh, one-off items, including uh, goodwill impairments from these uh, covenants. And you know, authors conclude from that, that uh, through the introduction of goodwill accounting, and if you look at the literature in a more broader sense, maybe through fair value accounting, the debt value uh, or the debt contracting uh, usefulness has, uh, has, has decreased over time. And with that, I hand over to Anna. Thank you, Martin. Um, so I will continue with uh, the evidence on uh, Anna, the initial. Anna, if I may quickly jump in, would it would it be okay if we take one question in between that that uh, relates to what Martin was talking about? Uh, I guess so. Yes. Would that be okay? So yes. Fabio has a question. Um, 
that he labels as provocative. Let's hear it, Fabio, please. Yes, yes. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, if, if for your point of view, uh, it's a close question that the goodwill should be recognized as a, as a, an asset. So if you have considered the, the, the option to, to review the account requirement for the goodwill to be recognized as a, a, an expense instead of an asset. Thank you so much. I like, I'll take that then. So it's Tim here again. Uh, so the board did think uh, an earlier stage in the project, it did consider whether it should um, uh, consider direct write-off of goodwill, which is, I think, what you're uh, referring to, Fabio. Um, and I think it, it decided not to pursue that because it felt that that was inconsistent with the board's conclusion that um, goodwill is an asset and that it does represent economic benefits. And I think um, that it also felt that it was inconsistent or it didn't reflect the economics of these transactions and that companies are paying uh, for benefits that they think they are going to receive in the future. And, and therefore to reflect it, uh, write, write goodwill off immediately um, didn't necessarily reflect the economics of the transaction as well. So it was it was um, considered at a much earlier stage of the project uh, by the board, but they decided not to pursue that. Um, I might add, Tim, um, we also, um, Fabio, have the experience of the UK. There was a period during which the UK did write off directly against um, goodwill. So we've got some evidence there that we can think about. Um, and uh, another element to this is that we are hearing from investors that they really like to know how much has been spent on the acquisition and how much is in that goodwill. So it's a key part of their calculations. Um, writing off against equity, if that figure disappears, they can't do that monitoring of management in a, in a stewardship way. So that's another thing we've been hearing recently as well. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio and, and uh, Tim and, and uh, Anna, please back to you. Thank you. So uh, to continue with the evidence uh, that we have from the literature on initial measurement of uh, goodwill, some studies examine uh, managers' decisions uh, to allocate parts of the uh, purchase price to goodwill. And they show that uh, these, these decisions can be very strategic. In other words, uh, decisions to allocate larger or smaller portions of the purchase price to goodwill uh, can vary with uh, uh, various reporting and contracting and compensation incentives such as uh, desire to report uh, high post acquisition profits, for example. On the question of information content of uh, goodwill impairments, uh, the evidence here is that uh, the informativeness of these goodwill impairments depends um, on the context. In other words, if the market anticipates these impairments, they have a purely confirmatory role um, in the sense that they do not um, uh, cause any uh, market reaction to the announcements. However, when um, these uh, goodwill impairments are unexpected, the market reacts to them and uh, the direction of this reaction depends on how they are framed with uh, the contemporaneous earnings. So one study shows that uh, if uh, goodwill impairments are tied to positive operating earnings, companies announcing them would earn positive abnormal returns. Whereas um, if uh, the goodwill impairment announcements are tied to negative operating earnings, then the uh, negative abnormal returns would uh, follow. Also, uh, the information content uh, depends on the credibility of the goodwill impairments and um, studies show that it also varies uh, cross-sectionally, for example, depending on uh, factors such as investor protection and um, other uh, country or industry specific factors. So if we can move to the next slide, please, Tim. So um, 
studies have also examined the predictive uh, value of goodwill impairments and while the literature agrees that uh, they do predict uh, future performance, uh, there is some mixed evidence on whether goodwill impairments uh, predict improvements or deterioration of uh, future performance because some studies shows, show a positive association uh, between goodwill impairments and future cash flows, whereas other studies show a negative association. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, briefly uh, talk about the evidence from um, a part of the literature that examines what determines uh, or what explains the, uh, the goodwill impairment decisions. In other words, do they relate to underlying economic fundamentals or um, are they driven by uh, managerial incentives? And uh, this literature shows that um, while goodwill impairment decisions are explained uh, to a large part by uh, the underlying fundamentals, um, they, they are also linked to managerial incentives. And this, is, uh, this result holds even um, in the presence of uh, a strong enforcement. Um, there is uh, uh, evidence, however, that um, certain factors moderate this discretion, managerial discretion in um, uh, making these goodwill impairment decisions. And uh, for example, in the presence of strong monitoring or uh, strong enforcement, the link uh, between these decisions and uh, economic fundamentals becomes stronger. And the link uh, between goodwill impairment decisions and the um, managerial incentives becomes uh, weaker. Uh, I would like again to invite Martin to um, add his uh, thoughts on uh, this uh, literature and also to conclude on this topic. Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to um, make a, a note, which I probably should have made uh, uh, at the very, very, very beginning. When Anna and I prepared these slides, you know, in cooperation with the other people who are here involved, uh, we wanted to add a few uh, references to studies uh, to the slides that indicate the type of work that is out there. Um, maybe the most, the, the earliest studies or, or what, you know, the studies that came immediately to our minds with the um, uh, questions that we are addressing here. Uh, I apologize to all of you out there who are, you know, who have done work that is not directly recognized here on these slides, that would have been impossible. I know a lot of you people who are listening now work in this area. So uh, please uh, apologize, my, my apologies and our apologies for that. Mm, I think it's uh, very interesting that the uh, Goodwill uh, uh, accounting uh, research is really uh, uh, spreading out and getting more diverse. And especially in that last point that Anna uh, mentioned, where we look at um, uh, mon uh, uh, moderating factors. Um, there, there's a, a great diversity of research out there with very, very interesting approaches and very interesting results. I would uh, close, like to close this uh, section here with a, a cautionary remark that I find appropriate, especially when we talk as academics also to non-academics who want to interpret our results, especially here in this context to uh, the ISB, of course. And that is, you know, how to make sense of these um, uh, results that we present in the academic studies. The majority of our studies are based on some sort of regression analyses, regression models. And uh, I, I think it's uh, important to point out that when we do find associations between explanatory factors, for instance, uh, underlying economic fundamental proxies or proxies for managerial incentives, that you know what we're finding is actually, as I said, an association, a statistical association, a tendency for one to be associated with the other. That is strong enough in the sample to show up according to statistical conventions or to conventions about you know the statistics we use here. Uh, it does not necessarily mean, and usually doesn't mean that when we find, let's say, a relation between economic fundamentals and goodwill impairment incidents that all of the goodwill impairment decisions are related to the underlying economics, only that there is a certain tendency for them to be so. Uh, 
And it also doesn't mean that when we find references or, or associations to managerial incentive proxies, that all goodwill impairment decisions are manipulated or biased and then uh, you know, maybe useless as, uh, in, in terms of information value. All we say is there is a certain tendency. Uh, one needs to look then in more detail and ideally the studies should give uh, you know, information on the economic significant, the significance of these results, right? how strong they are and what it means. But one has to be careful uh, when interpreting that and uh, that's a point I wanted to make on, on, on this. Okay, and again, I stop. Thank you very much, Martin and Anna. Um, so there's an opportunity now for you to ask questions, again, either in the chat or by speaking up. Uh, I'm sure that this topic provokes additional debate. Austin, shall, we, shall we start with a couple of polling questions again, just on- polling to questions again. I keep forgetting about those, Tim, I apologize. Yeah, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, so this is the next polling question. It looks at the debate around the reintroduction of amortization and whether there's been new evidence or arguments to support the use of either the impairment only approach or the amortization <laughs> with impairment approach since 2004, i.e. since IFRS 3 was issued and the impairment only approach has been followed by companies. So. Again, I'm going to attempt to deal with the uh, technology. Hopefully, you can now see that question. So, so A, yes, there is new evidence or arguments to support an impairment-only approach. B, yes, there's new evidence or arguments to support amortization approach. Or C, no, you don't believe there is new evidence or arguments to support either approach since, since IFRS 3 was issued. I'll give it a few seconds so people can I think we've got about a third of you voting so far. Up to about half, so we'll give it a few more So seconds. maybe maybe while the while the answers are rolling in, we could give the floor to Omiros who has a question in the chat. Omiros, would you like to uh, ask your question that you just posted? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's basically uh, in the introduction, there are these, uh, these views in a number of places uh, that the impairment test cannot provide information about the success of the acquisition. And actually there's a paragraph that says that uh, because of that, it's not really important whether we reintroduce amortization or not. Uh, but then at the same time, there is this view that the test uh, helps us hold management to account. So I find this, this thinking, which I think is new compared to the, uh, the standards that were there before, to be quite confusing. And also, I think it leaves us wondering uh, what is the point of having the test then? Yeah, so um, in terms of the, uh, we said the objective of the test is really to look at the cash generating unit as a whole and make sure that the cash generating unit that contains goodwill as a whole um, is, is recoverable. And that's the overall objective. So it's looking at that unit of account. It's not a direct test of goodwill. And because of, very, because of for example, shielding, um, you do have the potentially, as, as stakeholders say, you have the two latitude tune. It might not necessarily indicate an acquisition is, is not performing well when when it actually isn't because, because of the shielding effect. But in terms of the statement around the impairment test cannot provide information about the success of an acquisition, well, if you've not recorded an impairment, does that, how successful is that acquisition? It's not telling you anything about that. Um, and you, you can't tell, is it achieving exactly what, um, a, a company expected is it overachieving there's no sort of measure of the success so it can't tell you relatively about the success of it um, and 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 in fact because of the shielding issue for example sometimes it might not necessarily tell you that an acquisition is not performing um, as expected which is why the board explored and is exploring the disclosures that will provide you or investors with information about how an acquisition is performing, whether it's meeting expectations, whether it's underperforming, or whether it's over overperforming. Um, uh, uh, and and the other thing I would 
would say there is um, the inf however, investors still tell us that the information that the impairment test does provide is important and is still relevant. It might only be confirmatory, i.e. it might not necessarily come at exactly the time that they would expect it to come, but it at least they say, or some investors say, that it at least confirms their understanding that actually the acquisition hasn't gone according to plan. And some investors say it also allows a dialogue to be opened with management to discuss the performance and why, you know, what went wrong. Um, and, and it also indicates to investors, I think, that you know, management are being transparent about this acquisition that it hasn't performed uh, and why it hasn't performed and therefore are, are, are maybe moving on you know um, and maybe we'll make better decisions in, in in the future so i think i think uh, i can see where you say that there might be uh, those two statements might be slightly incompatible but um i think that's that's i think what we were sort of implying there that the impairment test isn't designed to give um, precise information about the performance of and the success of an acquisition and hopefully the disclosures the board exploring will help that particular issue but that's not to underestimate that the board still thinks the impairment test does an important job in terms of its objective and some investors do say that it still provides them with useful information i hope that answered your question i'll, I'll actually just end the poll now uh, and I shall share the results. So hopefully you can see the results. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there are a number of you answering uh, yes, to, so to A or B. Um, and so I think the ISB would be really interested to hear what new evidence or arguments you think there are. And, and hopefully you'll be able to maybe share some of those with us today. Um, and, and for those of you that have answered C, I guess that might suggest that there's, there isn't compelling evidence that a change is needed. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing the results. We've got one more polling question in this section. Uh, so if you just bear with me one second. So this is the, the, the third polling question. So do you agree with the ISB's preliminary view that it should adopt an indicator-based impairment test for goodwill? And if I can manage to launch that one so hopefully you can see yes I think yes you can say because I can see it's it's starting to move so again here so the options here is a yes it would reduce costs for companies without making the test significantly less robust. And that's effectively the ISB's preliminary view. So do you agree with the ISB's preliminary view? Or B, no, because a material impairment may occur without companies being able to identify an indicator of impairment. C, no, because it provides more opportunity for companies to avoid impairments if they so wish. D, no, because companies' expertise in performing the impairment test will be lost if they're not performed annually. And finally, E, no, because performing a review for indicators is just as costly as performing the test. And again, with this one, I, I can understand that you might want to agree with more than one answer, but if you can just please select the one that uh, you agree with the most. Maybe you can, I can uh, comment on the previous polling question. So all of you, so any of you who replied about new evidence having become available for ex uh, either about the impairment only approach or uh, um, amortization would be very useful if you could uh, follow up on that uh, on that voting by sending us um, references if possible um, especially I would be interested in uh, new evidence on the usefulness of amortization since that has been eliminated in most jurisdictions for quite some time now and I'd be really interested in learning about any new evidence especially on that specific issue because I'm not aware of any that would be very very helpful thank you Okay, so we seem to, I'll leave it open for about five more seconds. I was just about to say it seems to be stopping voting and there's, there's a sudden rush. Uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll leave it a few more seconds. We've got about 70% of you voting. Okay, I think I'm going to 
uh, end the poll there. And again, hopefully I can share the results with you there, which hopefully you can see those. Um, I guess for those answering B, it's not many of you, but um, that would be contrary to the ISB's view that it's unlikely that a material impairment could occur without there being an indicator that a company would identify. It also indicates that the ISB should think very carefully about guidance on indicators for impairment if um, it went down this uh, route. For those that answer C, and there is quite a lot of you uh, answering C, I think it's the second most popular by the um, by the look of it. Um, the ISB would like to hear more about why it's harder for companies to be challenged in their indicator assessments than for the assumptions they make they may make in a quantitative test or why there's more judgment in an indicator assessment because you know, isn't the judgment that, for example, a competitor's new product launch is not an indication impairment, isn't that the same judgment that a competitor's new product launch doesn't have a significant impact on the assumptions for sales volumes and sales prices that I'm going to use in my quantitative impairment test. So to me, that sounds like it's the same judgment that's, that, that's being made just in, in, in different circumstances. So it'd be interesting to hear from stakeholders what additional judgments they feel occur in an indicator assessment test and also whether auditors might find it harder to challenge companies. And then on E, there's a few of you answering E that it could be more costly. That's that's um, something that we have heard in feedback. Having to provide the evidence to support an indicator assessment can be as costly as performing a quantitative test. That's part of a well-organized and familiar annual process. And the ISB would then, I think, appreciate some insight into the costs of performing um, an indicator assessment. Okay. Austin. Thank you, Tim. We have one more question from the audience, uh, if I see correctly, and this is Mohammed. Mohammed, would you like to uh, make your comment, please? Um, thank. You. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, for giving me the chance. Um, basically, um, um, I, I did my my PhD it was about um, good or impairment, so um, I had a lot of uh, read in the literature. So, for uh, just a thought, uh, and I'm not sure whether you agree with me or not. But since most of the literature cite uh, that uh, managers tend to avoid uh, good impairments, basically bad news, try to report untimely good impairments, uh, and so on. So if, um, if, if they are given the chance not to do an impairment on an annual basis, just to simplify the process, it's most likely they will try to escape it. So we were giving them a bit of more relief uh, not to do the test unless there are other indicators. Um, and if we if we go to check um, deeper in the literature that look at um, how companies manipulate, how managers manipulate to um, escape the impairment by manipulating using this, the discount, uh, let's say discount factors and manipulating the cash flow. Um, and so basically, um, this also highlights that um, it, is, it, it won't be a good idea. Uh, just um, to simplify the process and asking them uh, not to do an annual impairment or uh, to skip the impairment and just do the amortization. So what is the point? Um, another, another thought about uh, uh, what you presented, and I totally understand the, the shield that ma management would have, or basically they would have uh, from rising in the internal goodwill that usually uh, mitigate or compensate any reduced goodwill from the purchase, purchased, uh, purchased goodwill. So uh, if we look at the overall position, uh, we basically want companies when they have a reduction in the future cash flow of the cash generating unit, regardless of it's because of goodwill or other assets, we want them to report properly to reflect whether the cash generating unit actually um, will, will show us the future cash flow expected or not. So um, if, even if goodwill is not tested um, individually as an asset, but still um, test, tested in the, in the performance of the cash generating unit, and therefore, um, this is what we need. We need the cash generating unit to report actually what the managers to report actually they, what they expect about the cash generating units, regardless of it's because of goodwill or other assets. 
So, so I, I understand, and this is why I said um, the, the current test, I mean, the, the current procedures for this test by its current state would, despite the limitation and the problems, would still uh, the best option we have. Simplifying would open the room for managers, uh, eliminating it would also open the room for managers, um, not adding more complex, because adding more complex would also become a, a big burden for managers and they will find their ways to escape it and so on. So I, my, my thought, just correct me if I'm wrong, but my thoughts with that, with the current situation, we are, we are still the best option. This is still the best option. And, th and thank you very much for, for, for the chance. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Um, so, I mean, on your last point, I mean, I think that's sort of where the board is, uh, um, in terms of when it's thinking about uh, impairment only approach or or amortization or reintroducing amortization. That's certainly sort of where the board has ended up in that, um, you know, looking at what the impairment test does do uh, and the objective of that impairment test, as I said, about um, ensuring that the cash carrying amounts of cash generating units are recoverable as a whole, not necessarily directly looking at Goodwill, but as a whole, you know, it's still doing an, an important job. It's not perfect, but it's, it, it is doing an important job. And in combination with the disclosures, which will give a bit more insight into the actual performance of the acquisition, um, that, that, that as a package you know, will help investors better hold uh, management to account. Now, on your point about moving to an indicator-based test and moving away from the requirement for an annual quantitative test and that that will allow companies to um, avoid impairments um, even easier, make that even easier for companies to manipulate and, and to, to avoid an impairment. I think that's that sort of goes back to the point that I was, I was just making in response to the um, the polling question, I think the board would really like to hear from stakeholders who have that view, because we have heard it, that they are worried about the impact on the robustness of the test. Uh, and, and some have said it's because they think there's more judgment as a consequence of, um, of, of moving to an indicator based test. I think the board would really like to hear some, some uh, examples of where they think, where stakeholders think there is additional judgment. Because going back to the example that I used, um, if a competitor's just launched a new product and that's just starting to have an impact on my market share, if I'm doing an indicator-based assessment, uh, I'm going to look at some evidence, I gather some evidence, look at what's happened when that companies maybe launched a product in the past and, and so on and so forth, gather some evidence and make a judgment. And I might make the judgment that that's not an indicator of, uh, of impairment. If I'm today having to do a quantitative impairment test, well, I'm trying to work out what, what sales volumes and what sales prices shall I put as my assumptions within that quantitative impairment test. And in order to work that out, I've got to consider that my competitors just launched a new product and will that have a significant impact on my sales volumes and sale prices assumptions uh, and I would I to me I would be making the same judgment based on whatever evidence I've got I might make the judgment that it's not going to have a significant impact and I'll reflect that in my assumptions to me that's the same judgment in two different processes and therefore the comment that uh, we sometimes hear from stakeholders that it's more judgmental an indicator assessment approach. I think the board would really like to hear some examples of where stakeholders think it's more um, judgmental. And and some auditors, said, and again, this would be really good feedback as well, that it's sometimes harder to challenge an indicator assessment than it is a, a, an assumption in a quantitative test and again in my simple example the evidence that I'd be using for the judgment that I've made about my competitors new product launch would be the same evidence in both cases so again I think the board would really like to hear from auditors some more sort of detailed assumptions around um, you know uh, so uh, uh, examples around why it is harder to challenge uh, an indicator assessment rather than a, um, a quantitative assumption uh, but, um, Mahavid, I mean, you make uh, a good point, and it's certainly something that we've heard uh, in the outreach that we've we've conducted, and, and we're hoping that stakeholders will give us some better, well, some additional uh, feedback on those points to sort of give a bit more colour for the board. Yeah. 
Uh, Tim, it's Tom Scott. Can I just make a comment? Sure. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, just um, it also it really underlies the need for people doing research. We do have, there is an American study, uh, as you know, there's an optional indicators approach there. That study finds no difference in the incidence of impairment between people choosing the indicators approach versus people who are sticking with the required. Um, so people could go out and generate additional studies, uh, especially kind of using IFRS data or using more recent uh, time span, or if they could find something, that'll be really helpful to us as well as, as the, what all those things Tim described, um, because we do in the end want to rely on the best set of evidence we can amass. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. So there's a little bit of uh, discussion still going on in the chat, but looking at the time, I think I just want to briefly summarize the gist of it and then move on to our last topic. So some of you are commenting in the chat that, of course, there is a trade-off between um, simplifying the process and the cost to preparers versus giving them more discretion, which might uh, be misused. And then, of course, there's also the notion of what kind of evidence uh, would actually be needed to settle the issue of embolization versus impairment once and for all. And, and unfortunately, probably there is not the one study that's going to uh, settle the issue to everyone's satisfaction. Um, let us maybe go on to the next and final topic. And if we have time, uh, Towards the end, uh, we can still take additional questions about all the topics we covered, I would suggest. Thank you, please. Okay, it's me again. Um, so uh, there are two more topics that are included in the discussion paper and we'll briefly touch on those um, now. Uh, firstly, the ISP's preliminary view is that companies should present on the statement of financial position the amount of total equity excluding goodwill. The ISB's view is that such an amount could be a useful flag to investors to highlight those companies for which goodwill is a significant portion of, and sometimes more than, their total equity. The ISB did consider whether the amount should exclude some or all intangible assets as well as goodwill, but in its view, goodwill is sufficiently different to other assets that the focus should be on goodwill. Now, presenting the amount as an integral subtotal within all balance sheet formats may not necessarily be possible and therefore the amount would need to be presented as a freestanding amount in the statement of financial position. The ISP also considered whether entities should assume some intangible assets within goodwill and not recognise them separately in a business combination. The ISP had feedback from stakeholders that questioned whether the separate recognition of some identifiable intangible assets was useful, where those intangible assets are difficult to value reliably, and where distinguishing some intangible assets is complex and subjective. Some stakeholders also question why some intangible assets are recognised separately in a business combination, but similar internally generated intangible assets are not recognised. However, stakeholders' views are mixed, as some said that separate recognition does provide useful information about what a company paid for and separately recognising intangible assets with finite lives rather than subsuming them in goodwill, which is not amortised, is more useful. So the ISB's preliminary view is that there's no compelling evidence to change the recognition criteria for identifiable intangible assets in a business combination, given the mixed views. Considering the concerns of those investors who want to align the accounting treatments for acquired and internally generated intangible assets is beyond the scope of this particular project. However, the ISB encourages stakeholders who would want the ISB to consider adding a broader project on intangible assets to its work plan to respond to the ISB's upcoming agenda consultation. So this slide just provides a summary of the ISB's preliminary views and how they line up against the project's objective. The ISB considers its preliminary views as a package of views that interconnect uh, rather than in, as individual preliminary views considered in isolation. And the ISB asks stakeholders to also consider their responses to its preliminary views in this way as well, and to consider the interactions between the different preliminary views. 
Overall, the ISP has provided preliminary views, which in its view would provide better information to use as the financial statements on business combinations and help hold management to account for its acquisition decisions by both the disclosures and the subsequent accounting for good will and provide some cost relief to preparers so that a, a reasonable balance between costs and benefits is achieved. So again, I'll, I'll hand over now, I think, to Anna, who will just give us uh, a summary of the academic research that's relevant to these final topics in the discussion paper. Thank you, Tim. So um, on the two questions, uh, the first presenting um, equity before goodwill on the balance sheet and uh, the second uh, the, ten, the current decision not to change uh, the accounting for uh, recognized identifiable intangible assets. Uh, I will briefly um, uh, provide uh, evidence. Uh, first, starting with um, the question on uh, presentation of uh, equity before goodwill. The evidence here comes from uh, studies that look at uh, whether investors uh, place differential weight on items that are presented on the face of uh, the financial statements uh, versus whether they're presented in the notes. And I would say here the, the evidence is um, uh, mixed because while some studies show that uh, investors overfixate on uh, items that are uh, on the face of the financial statements, uh, other studies, and there is a study that looks at this issue in the context of uh, goodwill related amounts, uh, they do not uh, find any difference uh, in the market reaction to items, uh, depending on whether they're on the face or elsewhere in the financial statements. And uh, related to the second question, uh, most of the evidence comes from studies that look at uh, the usefulness of uh, recognized uh, identifiable intangible assets, but not necessarily only arising from uh, business combinations. And uh, the takeaway from the literature here is that uh, these uh, recognized assets are useful uh, for investors and um, for analysts because uh, there is evidence that they're uh, associated with stock prices and returns and also associated with uh, analyst uh, forecast uh, properties. Um, a few studies look at uh, recognized identifiable intangible assets that arise in, in business combinations and uh, the evidence there is a bit uh, inconclusive because uh, um, one study, for example, finds that uh, there is an association with uh, future performance uh, and another study fails to find such a link. So, uh, but overall, uh, these uh, recognized uh, identifiable intangible assets um, have been shown to, to be informative and of use to uh, investors and uh, analysts. So I will uh, pause here and again invite uh, Martin to add uh, some thoughts and to conclude. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Um, one uh, um, remark one could make here is that a lot of the research on intangible assets was done in Australia or, and by Australian uh, scholars. Uh, you colleagues might recognize some of the names and uh, uh, on, on, on that slide here. Uh, and the reason for this um, strong orientation of Australian uh, academics in, in accounting for intangibles is that up until the introduction of IFRS, uh, Australian companies had quite a, you know, wide discretion for, that's my understanding at least, for uh, recognizing intangibles on their balance sheets. And for them, that's very, very different, for instance, to companies in, in Germany, uh, the introduction of IFRS actually restricted um, uh, the, uh, their, their discretion for recognizing intangibles. Um, specifically, Anna mentioned that um, individually identifiable assets, intangible assets from business combinations, here our evidence is quite sparse. Uh, and I think there is actually that's actually quite an, an interesting, if you like, gap in the literature, and, and there could be more research on that. I uh, would like to use the opportunity here to uh, raise a question to, to the audience, and that is for 
whether you are aware of qualitative studies in that area. Because, you know, when we look at, for instance, the individually identifiable intangible assets, you know, what has been done is value relevant studies and what has been done is looking at an association with properties of financial analyst forecasts, which are kind of indirect ways to infer some usefulness. It's a very intriguing question whether you know, brands, R&D, uh, or, or customer relationships, which are terribly difficult to measure, whether they have an inherent information value and what actually, what, what users actually do with that. So if you are aware of qualitative studies, for instance, that address that question or other qualitative studies, in fact, in the area of, of business combinations, we all would be very, very interesting in hearing about this. Uh, you know, what, what do analysts actually do with this? Do they actually use this information? Do, do they use, and in what ways do they use the brand values or the, you know, customer relation values? Uh, I would find that very, very interesting indeed. So much, thank you very much for the moment. Thank you, Martin. Let's even make this question a bit broader. We're interested in any study, qualitative or any other non-archival study, including experiments, for example, that actually use decision makers, analysts, and other investors uh, um, and their actual decision-making processes. Um, I have one question in the chat that, that comes from Dennis. Dennis, please give us a question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and my question would regard the simplification of volume use calculations. So it is proposed to consider within the cash flows enhancement and restructurings, but yet these cash flow projections should still be reasonable and supportable. And I was wondering, where is the difference to a fair value less cost of disposal calculation in the end? Because normally, if I were an investor and would say, or take the market um, perspective and would do a fair value calculation, an investor would probably also um, consider upcoming restructurings that may not be um, recognized under IS 37, but would normally be done by a market participant. So I was wondering where would be the differences between the two cash flow models in IS 36? Uh, Dennis, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, and it's certainly something that, that um, we heard. I mean, you're right. It, uh, by including those cash flows, um, within the value and use calculations, it does, it does then narrow the differences between value and use uh, and a fair value less cost to dispose. Um, uh, and I, I guess, uh, you know, value and use will, will still be reflecting entity assumptions rather than a, um, a fair value approach, which um, reflects what the market believes the, the fair value to be. But you're right, the actual differences between the two become a lot more narrow. And in fact, we have heard some feedback in the outreach that we've um, been conducting so far that some have said, well, if it's, if it's narrowing it down so much, actually, should the board consider uh, just moving to one, to one method, as it, uh, as it were? Um, so, I mean, that's, that's certainly something that uh, the board would be, hear, be interested to hear stakeholders yeah. views on so i yeah, mean that is a great question why not simply call it fair value and use yeah that would be maybe some sort of a <laughs> way to make it easier yeah, i mean the, the distinction between whether something's maybe going to you know what its sale course, value is course. versus what, yeah, yeah. what it might be used within the business but um but no it i mean it, it is a reasonable challenge i think and it's something Thank you very much. i'm sure that we'll consider uh, as we look at the feedback um, Thorsten, shall I do the last polling question? Yes, please, Tim. Uh, so th this is the last one. Uh, so this is asked whether you agree with the ISB's preliminary view that the recognition criteria for intangible assets acquired in a business combination should not be changed. Again, just bear with me as I play with the technology. Uh, hopefully, you'll now see that particular polling question said so again the options here are so yes um, you do agree uh, the separate recognition of these intangible assets provides useful information allows companies to explain what they've bought and also avoids including tangible assets with finite lives within goodwill um, so b no some of the 
of these intangible assets, recognising a business combination do not have reliable valuations to be useful. C, no, some of the intangible assets recognising a business combination are so similar to goodwill, separating them from goodwill provides no useful information. It's complex as well. And finally, D, no, intangible assets that would not be recognised if internally generated hinder investors making comparisons between companies that grow by acquisition and those that grow organically. Again, one usual comment, if you agree with more than one answer, just please select the one that you agree with the most. We've got up to about 50%, so we'll just keep it open a little bit longer. Maybe in the meantime, Tim, we can take <clears throat> one more comment from Alexander. Alexander has an interesting study that he'd like to talk about. Alexander, please. Uh, yes. Um... I have a, currently an academic study uh, in which we look at uh, intent, acquired intangible assets from uh, different slices, you can say. We uh, especially collect hand collected uh, in acquired intangible assets, uh, definite, indefinite, customer assets, brand as uh, marketing assets, tech assets in which the IRFS and both the uh, US GAAP actually uh, yeah um, illustrated and what we find is it it particularly works quite well the accounting especially uh, definite assets work really really well uh, also indefinite uh, intangible assets and what we particularly also find as a as a form of a direct test of what the FASB is uh, currently um, uh, proposing is that non-compete agreements actually have no value relevance for equity investors, uh, which is, was an intrigue finding for us. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, <clears throat> there's currently not much else going on in the chat. Maybe if I can summarize one of the impressions I'm getting from some of the discussion at the chat as well, um, and also from the research that we've been looking at. Um, some of, some of uh, those commenting today have been bringing up the issue, uh, you know, is it all about um, subsequent measurement uh, or should we also be reconsidering recognition? Um, so is goodwill an asset? That's the, I think the oldest question in this whole uh, debate, but it's still a relevant one. And it seems like um, research is also having a hard time settling that question because uh, of course, research, most empirical archival research looks at aggregates. So we look at the goodwill asset uh, uh, for a large number of companies over, or typically over several periods, or at least we're looking at goodwill in aggregate. For example, in the value relevance regression, we're going to look at a coefficient on the goodwill asset across a large number of companies, and we look at an average coefficient. Uh, and on average, goodwill might be value relevant more or less so perhaps than other intangible assets or other assets. But um, of course, uh, this is all context dependent. And uh, there might be cases where the residual that we end up calling goodwill by default is actually an expense and overpayment. And that of course is something that has been debated. But the question is if we can devise better research and finer research that gets at the underlying differences between residual amounts that are more likely to be assets and others that are more likely to reflect overpayment. Um, so maybe goodwill could in the future be subjected to a little bit more of a differentiated approach where um, before calling it an asset and putting it on the balance sheet, uh, we might subject it to um, criteria that come of course directly from the framework. So some form of uh, documentation by management that there actually are expected uh, future economic benefits. So, so I just, just on the poll question, so I've, I've just shared the result. Uh, um, uh, just looking at this, actually there's quite a clear preference here, which is yes, um, um, most of the audience think separate recognition of these intangible assets does provide useful information. Um, that's that's interesting as it's slightly different to the feedback the ISB has received in the project where there's much more of a range of views and, and a range of problems identified, albeit you know, um, there are some of the audience that are identifying some of those, um, uh, some, some of those uh, problems. 
Um, and, and because of that mm-hmm. range of problems, uh, the, the board's view was that the, there wasn't compelling enough evidence that particular change should be made. Sorry, Anne, did you want to jump in? I just, yeah, Tim, I, I think that the poll here is interesting because of what we do hear from investors. Um, so as we went out collecting information, we did get some surprising things from investors and preparers that we weren't necessarily expecting. But I think one of the things that Tim's pointing to here is that there are some investors that are really adamant that this process doesn't help them because the people who say yes are working on the assumption that that separate recognition conveys information to analysts and that's what some researchers conclude. But when we actually talk to some people, they find it actually not helpful And indeed, within the board, there's at least one person who would really like us to change this because of the complications with the amortization after the, when they are dealing with the separately identifiable intangible, the situation compared to the unrecognized intangibles makes their analysis difficult. So that's something where the feedback that we've received is somewhat different to these poll results tonight. But Tim, I was thinking also about a couple of other things where we got feedback, which wasn't necessarily what we're expecting. And I'm thinking of things like, we thought that preparers um, might favor combine not having to separately recognize the identifiable intangibles because as academics, we think that they're hard to measure and value and so forth. And yet that wasn't feedback that we heard from our consultative groups. Um, Another one was, that we thought um, there would be, oh, what's the second one I was thinking of? Um, Sorry, I've forgotten it. But we did get this counter feedback that in, in, it's good to get it, but in some ways it's hard for us to then deal with it, particularly if we've got academic evidence going one way and then these preparer or um, analyst views going the other way. In a way, what what you're sort of expressing is sort of the view that the board was sort of presented with, I guess, uh, from the post implementation review and during the course of the project as well on on, on intangible assets, which is um, there are a range of different views and uh, and there are a range of problems that a number of stakeholders sort of identify. Uh, and some of these are up here, you know, about reliable valuations and uh, problems with amortization of some of these intangible assets and, and so on. Um, but what what the board because different stakeholders that identify different problems they will also identify different sets of intangible assets that are a problem to them therefore the board was sort of presented with not compelling evidence that a particular change uh, was needed and then there were uh, some stakeholders that did feedback and said they thought that this actually uh, did provide useful information so i think that's, that's partly why the board sort of ended up with the preliminary view that it did, which said it didn't have compelling enough evidence that a particular change should be made to intangible asset recognition. Thank you, Tim. If if you allow, I would like to give the floor to Nicola for a final question before we'll have to close the session for today. Nicola, I would like to ask about the relevance of information uh, to debt markets. Nicola, please. Yes, uh, I'm coming. uh from uh, from emerging countries from ecuador and then looking in our companies with uh, with large companies which have to apply um, ifrs and you see lots of non-compliance out there and because they do finance mostly from debt markets and we talk about goodwill impairment as a one form of conditional conservatism so whether there was i'm i'm wondering whether I, isb uh, has looked at the uh, as a relevance of uh, these issues of good impairment for debt market. Martin has mentioned that there are a few studies which are not so compelling about the, the, the usefulness of, uh, of good impairment for debt market. But I'm wondering if it is that something that he has, uh, could be interested in. Lots of evidence that we heard today is related to, to use for stock markets, analyst properties, and so on. But as a form of conditional conservatism, all the impairments have some at least theoretically, are of interest for 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 debt contracting as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a very good point, and I, I think um, as as far as possible, we're um, trying to reach out to as many investors and as many investor types uh, as as we can 
uh, through our outreach um, process and, and hopefully also try to encourage as many investor types to respond uh, to the, the con consultation. Um, so, I mean, it's something that obviously, you know, we, we would be very keen to hear whether there is a difference in opinions from debt investors compared to equity investors as, as you're sort of um, uh, asking. And, and it's, it's, uh, hopefully we will, um, the board will be able to get uh, some insight into that. Um, but it's something that obviously we're, we're working hard to try to uh, get as much evidence as, as we can, but it's, it's a great point. Thanks to all of you for your insights you know, among the participants here in the, in the meeting. Also, thank you uh, to the panelists for presenting the material and uh, giving us insights into these academic papers that speak to uh, the ISB's discussion paper. Um, let me wrap up the session here. Some of you have already disappeared either into bed or into Friday afternoon. Um, we had a uh, a high of 140 participants today, which is roughly the expected 40% of registered people. That's always typically where we land. So thank uh, all of you very much. Um, please do share with us additional uh, evidence, papers, thoughts uh, that you can think of that could uh, be relevant to the discussion. Anna has uh, shared her email address in the beginning. And uh, please remember that this uh, uh, meeting will be uh, has been recorded will be posted onto the uh, European Accounting Association's Accounting Resources Center website the ARC website if you want to look at it again or show it to your students or uh, review some of the discussion that we had uh, and the next one is being prepared as I talked about in the beginning business combinations under common control that will be our third EAA ISB virtual workshop and uh, probably this will take place early next year. So stay tuned, please uh, go check our uh, Accounting Resources Center website on a frequent basis. And a good weekend to all of you. I enjoyed this very much. Uh, it was good to see you all. Thank you. <laughs>